So welcome to Surveillance and Recurrence, a Patient Insight webinar from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. We'd like to thank EMD Serono Pfizer Partnership, Genentech, Faring, Photocure, Merck, and Insight for their support of the Patient Insight webinar series. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Research at Beacon. I'm joined tonight by Dr. Gier Lotan and Isla Skinner to discuss surveillance and recurrence for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Welcome. It's nice to have you here. Let me first introduce our presenters. Dr. Gier Lotan is a Professor of Urology and Chief of Urologic Oncology. He holds the Helen J. and Robert S. Strauss Professorship in Urology at UT Southwestern Medical Center. He's also the Medical Director of the Urology Clinic at UT Southwestern and Parkland Health and Hospital System. As a professor in the Department of Urology, his practice focuses on oncology and endourology. His research is focused on areas of bladder cancer screening, biomarkers, decision analysis, and health economics. Dr. Isla Skinner, from Stanford University is chair of the Department of Urology. She's a Thomas Stamey Research Professor in Urology. Her primary focus has been in the surgical treatment of locally advanced bladder cancer and is a nationally recognized expert in bladder reconstruction and continent urinary diversions. She's active in ongoing clinical trials in the treatment of bladder cancer and other urologic malignancies. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you with us. So Dr. Lotan, I believe you should be able to control the screen. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, very happy to be here and hopefully uh, we can have an informative uh, conversation about bladder cancer. And so we have a formal presentation and then uh, we uh, very much welcome any questions. So we know that uh, bladder cancers uh, initially start in the lining of the bladder, the urethelium. And they're mostly caused by env environmental factors uh, such as carcinogens, uh, smoking being the most common cause, uh, impacting more than half of all patients who have bladder cancer. Uh, but we do know that about a quarter of patients at least uh, have never uh, smoked uh, in their life, even though it's a little hard to determine who has had secondhand smoke exposure. It used to be that anytime you flew on a plane or were in a restaurant or a bar, uh, people were smoking freely around you. Thankfully, that has uh, decreased. Uh, we know that the natural history of bladder cancer tends to recur, uh, especially the non-invasive type, because usually we try to spare your bladder, uh, which most patients prefer. The problem is that a lot of times bladder cancer is like a weed. It shows up in one area, you remove it, and then you see it in another area at a different time. Uh, we know that there are uh, certain factors um, that, uh, sorry, playing with this thing, that there are several factors that impact uh, the risk of recurrence, progression, and spread. And just for the sake of this discussion, I think it's important to distinguish what a difference between a recurrence and a progression is. So if you have a patient that has a non-invasive cancer that's confined to the lining or the mucosa, and their cancer comes back and it's still just in the mucosa, that is a recurrence. However, if the cancer has invaded more deeply into the submucosa or into the muscle, that is considered a progression. Similarly, if you have a patient who has low-grade cancer and then their recurrence is high-grade, that is considered a progression as well. When we talk about spread, we're usually implying spread outside the bladder to the lymph nodes or to another organ. And so there are a couple ways that physicians characterize cancers. The first one is a stage, and the stage is really how deep does a cancer go. Interestingly, stage zero is when it's confined to the lining. It's also known as a TA tumor. And it's funny to talk about a cancer that's stage zero when you still have cancer. Other people, when they have stage zero, it means they don't have cancer. Uh, stage one is when it's going into the lamina propria, or in this case, the uh, submucosa. Stage two is when it's going into the muscle, and stage three into the fat. Stage four is when it's going into adjacent organs like the prostate or the cervix or the vagina, for example. 
the grade is really how a tumor looks like under a microscope. So low-grade cancers typically look very similar to the normal lining, but you may have more cells than you're supposed to have, or maybe the architecture is a little abnormal. High-grade, the cells look very abnormal in appearance. Uh, they may be dividing a lot, and they have an atypical shape. So what impacts recurrence? Well, the first thing is, uh, you know, uh, that impacts it is, did you show up with one tumor or multiple tumors? Uh, did you already have a prior tumor? Was it a large tumor or a small tumor? Was it high grade or low grade? Uh, was it invasive or non-invasive? And did you have carcinoma in situ? The other thing that confers risk is if you've had prior treatment. So a patient who recurs after prior treatment is more likely to progress or spread. And there are different risk classifications. One's called the EURTC because it was based on uh, European trials, uh, and they looked at a large number of patients and tried to predict who would recur or progress. Now, um, when we look at risk groupings, uh, we have different ways of characterizing them. Low-risk patients are typically considered uh, um, patients who have a small, low-grade tumor. Uh, about half of them will recur, though, but progression is very rare. So almost nobody goes from low grade to high grade, and low grade small to single tumors almost never become invasive. Intermediate risk uh, includes patients with multiple or recurrent low grade tumors, but they may also include some patients with small, single, high grade tumors that are non invasive. Their risk of recurrence is a little bit higher. And progression rates about 10%. And so they can become invasive, but not very frequently. High risk tumors are the ones we're very concerned about. They include patients with carcinoma in situ, multiple or recurrent high grade tumors, or patients who have lamina propria invasion. And those patients have a recurrence rate as high as 70% and progression rate over 20%. And those are the patients who we, we really need to do additional treatments for to try to keep them from progressing. Because if those tumors progress, a lot of times we start recommending removal of the bladder, maybe recommend chemotherapy. So this is a group where, uh, where we have a high level of concern. Well, how do we decide uh, what to do and how often to look? Generally speaking, the, the frequency that we look in the bladder really relates to the likelihood of you having a recurrence or progression. So there are a couple of uh, approaches. The most common approach, obviously, is to look in the bladder, uh, which is typically a, a flexible cystoscopy. Uh, it can identify most papillary tumors, but we know that it can miss uh, upwards of 20 to 30 percent of patients with carcinoma in situ, because carcinoma in situ can look like a little red patch. Uh, or uh, and and can sometimes be missed. Um, the frequency that we do cystoscopy really depends on the risk that you might have cancer. So if we found a new cancer and we resect it, we always want to look around three months after the initial resection. That's somewhat arbitrary, but there are a couple of reasons why you might have cancers at three months. One, the cancer may have come back, or we may have incompletely resected it the first time around. So when we scrape Maybe when we looked around, maybe the edges, we left a, little, a few cancer cells, or maybe there was another area in the bladder that we missed completely. Uh, and uh, based on that, uh, we want to look early. Now, if you only had one small low-grade tumor and we looked at three months and you don't have cancer, we probably don't need to look for a while. We may not need to look for another nine months, maybe another six months, but we don't need to look three months from now. And if at that time you still don't have cancer, we might only look once a year. For intermediate and high risk, they already have shown a propensity for having multiple tumors or high-grade tumors. And so we look every three months for two years. We don't want to take any chances. If after two years you don't have cancer, then we'll look every six months uh, from years three to five. And if you go for five years without cancer, we'll look every year after that. What else do we do? Well. Um, because of the fact that we may miss some cancers, we usually collect urine and have a pathologist look under a microscope, and we call that urine cytology. The problem with that is it's a bit inconsistent. It can miss 20 to 30% of high-grade disease. 
You may say, why? Well, it's because maybe there aren't a lot of cells floating around in the urine. Maybe you've already had a treatment with chemotherapy or immune therapy, and the cells look a little abnormal, but maybe the pathologist thought that they were just uh, reactive because of the treatment, and they don't necessarily think it's high-grade disease. We also know that most low-grade tumors um, look very similar to normal cells, and so it, it, uh, cytology will miss most of those. Sometimes you get atypical response, uh, um, uh, atypical results that happens fairly often, anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of the time, and some centers more. And that again has to do with the fact that uh, you've done surgery in the bladder, uh, so you have reactive cells. Maybe you've given treatments, and now the cells don't look perfectly normal, but they don't look abnormal enough. The other problem is that we send them at the time we look in the bladder, and we don't get the results for a week. So sometimes you got to call back and. You thought everything was fine, and now you have abnormal cells, and now we say, oh, maybe we need to do something different. We do know one thing, though. If pathologist says you have cancer cells, then we are worried, and usually it, we might order a CAT scan to look at the lining of the kidneys or the ureter, because about 5% of the time you have, might have a cancer up there that we can't see in the bladder. And then sometimes we say we, we need to go do a biopsy to make sure you don't have carcinoma in situ. Have some examples of what this might look like. Um, here um, to your left, you have fairly normal looking cells. This is what normal bladder cells look like. They have, uh, they're respecting each other. They're not crowding each other. The nuclei in the middle look very, uh, you know, nice circles, uh, very typical. And this to the right is what a high grade cancer. The cells are, are clumped together, they're crowded. They have abnormal looking nuclei. They don't necessarily look the same. Uh, some of them have more than one nuclei, and this is what a high grade cancer might look like. Well, I just told you the cytology is not great. It misses 20 to 30 percent of high grade cancers. It misses most low grade cancers. And so there have been a lot of uh, studies and, uh, and companies doing research to try to find better ways to look at, uh, use the urine to look for cancer. And that's because uh, bladder cancer is right next to the urine. And so different things are shed into the urine, whether or not they're proteins or cells um, or RNA or DNA. And there's a variety of different approaches that people have used and commercial markers that, have, that are available to look for bladder cancer. But there's a caveat. First of all, uh, there's no single marker that's been good enough to replace cystoscopy. We know the sensitivity, which is the likelihood of being able to find cancer, is better than cytology, especially for low-grade cancers. But the specificity is less than cytology. And specificity is an important thing. And for example, um, what does that mean? Well, specificity means that if you have a positive test, then it means you have bladder cancer. So this, most patients who have a uh, abnormal cytology, which we see cancer cells, more than 90% will actually have bladder cancer. But the same cannot be said for, for a lot of these markers. So uh, if you have a positive marker, sometimes only 20 to 30% of the time do you actually have cancer. The rest of the time you have what we call a false positive, which means that the marker was positive, but you don't have cancer. Sometimes we think you might have what we call an anticipatory positive, which means you have some abnormal DNA or RNA or protein, but it's from only a small number of cells that we still can't see. And maybe you'll have a cancer in the future, but it may take months and months for it to grow large enough for us to see with a naked eye uh, or with our cystoscope or even with blue light. And so we don't know how to interpret or what to tell the patient. We can't really tell them you have cancer and we need to do something different, like take out your bladder. On the other hand, we have some concerns. So right now we don't have an ideal marker and the guidelines don't have specific recommendations on what to do. And we're still working towards getting appropriate markers that will change um, clinical decision-making. Because up until then, you really don't want necessarily to have a marker that might make recommendations to stop one treatment or start another treatment until you're sure that it means you have cancer. So we're still not quite there. We're doing a lot of research and hopefully in the next five years, we'll have some new markers that maybe will help us make a clinical decision.